So what's a stem cell? So you, you probably read in the Daily Mail all about stem cells and uh, it's, uh, the Daily Mail has a very bad name among doctors at the moment because they keep publishing individual patient stories which are total outliers. They're just so unusual what happens to these patients and it's usually based on grievances or, or bad uh, one case when the NHS did fail them and it's, uh, it's uh, anyway, it's, it's, um, it's a bit of a problem. But uh, the truth about stem cells is that uh, there's two things that uh, they, a cell has to be able to do. So we know our bodies are made up of billions and billions of cells. And that's the individual little things that make up our body. And what stem cells can do is if you put them in a dish, they can grow and grow and grow and grow and grow. And the type of stem cells that we put onto the surface of patients' eyes, we could take one cell and we can grow enough skin for the eye to cover 55 doubles tennis courts. That's how powerful they are. That's how much you can get them to grow. The second thing that a stem cell, that a cell has to be able to do before you can describe it as a stem cell is that it has to be able to turn into something useful. So sitting in a dish, it might just be a stem cell, but it doesn't do anything. Stem cells tend to sit around the body doing actually nothing. What happens is when they divide, so when they produce a daughter cell, that daughter cell goes off and does all the work, but the stem cell gets all the glory. <laughs> but you see the problem with that, if you knock out the stem cells, then you can't generate any more daughter cells. So that's how the system works. So there are the two things, that stem, well, that's what makes up a stem cell. It's a cell that sits around the body, not particularly doing very much itself, but it's capable of giving rise to these daughter cells over and over again, it gives rise to daughter cells which go off and form useful parts of the body. Okay? And we divide them into really two main types. There's embryonic stem cells, and then there's what we call adult stem cells or tissue stem cells. Embryonic stem cells are obviously individual cells that are taken from embryos. Now this is obviously has ethical issues. And I'm not really going to talk a huge amount more about embryonic stem cells for two reasons. First of all, we don't work with them. We focus on using adult stem cells. Um, and secondly, the ethics, ethical principles and the, also the biology involved is so complex that it makes getting an embryonic stem cell treatment to the clinic very, very, very difficult. It's much, much easier to work with adult stem cells and it's much easier to get through the ethical and the, the practical uh, scientific hurdles if we work with the adult stem cells. So that's why we chose to focus on adult stem cells. So what, what are adult stem cells and what, how are they different? Well, uh, this is actually Finn, my son, and this is my dad. And the difference between the two of them is, uh, well, apart from the obvious, is that um, my, my dad's body has been turned over many, 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 many times. That's not the same body as he was born with. Almost every single tissue in that body has been regenerated throughout his lifetime. And so the cells that are responsible for that are actually the adult stem cells. And Finn has got a body that's packed full of these adult stem cells, and throughout his life, they'll continuously replace the bits of them that are damaged, replace the bits that wear out, and um, uh, that's, that's what adult stem cells are, and that's why we have them. Okay? And we can, uh, we can find them all over the body. There's several different types in the eye. There's adult stem cells in your retina. There's your whole lining of your gastrointestinal tract. It's turned over every few days. So you, you know, it's, it's, it's replaced every few days. And, and, and that's stem cells that, that do that. And lastly, blood. So you recycle your blood. You replace your blood every so many days, I can't remember, back to medical school now. You used to have to know that. <laughs> okay, so the way in which these adult stem cells are being used at the moment is to repair tissues, we're looking at maybe growing organs and dishes, uh, or replacing parts of organs. So it's a bit like we don't, at the moment we're not actually replacing whole eyes, you replace parts of eyes or individual pieces. And um, there's a lot of publicity at the moment about face transplants, and this is an example of how people take skin stem cells, they grow a sheet of skin in the lab, and they transplant that onto parts of the body where the skin is effectively missing or failed. 
So this was the first kind of example of using stem cells to treat patients with skin stem cells. The other thing, and this is very relevant to aniridia, is that we could take some of the stem cells, in theory now, this is in theory, we could take some stem cells from our children who have aniridia. And we could theoretically correct the problem with the Pax6 gene. And theoretically, we could then put them back into our children, and that could be a treatment for aniridia. So that's, that's, that's a dream, but it would be amazing if we could do that. But that's what, what Vicky and um, many of our other researchers will speak today are, are working on. So what we've been doing with stem cells at the Institute in London is um, we're looking at retinal disease, so using stem cells to treat the retina, and that's like the film in the camera, it's the lining inside the eye that senses the light. So there's a whole group working on retinal stem cells. There's another group of people looking at glaucoma stem cells. So glaucoma is a completely different disease, and I risk even confusing myself and you even more now, but uh, glaucoma is when pressure builds up in your eye. So it's like a car tire. You're meant to have a certain amount of pressure. Too little and you've got a flat, too much, and you've got a really, really tense tire which could blow out. So your eye will never blow out, but it causes damage. So in glaucoma, you get a very tense, hard eye, and this damages the nerve at the back. And that's why we talk about pressure, pressure, pressure when we're treating glaucoma. But when the nerve is damaged, there's actually nothing you can do. It's, it's, the nerve is, is permanently damaged. But that may change in that there's people like Keith Martin in Cambridge who are looking at growing cells, transplanting them into the nerve to either protect what vision you've got left or to regrow the nerves that were damaged by the glaucoma. So that's exciting research, but again, very much in the early stages. And the last thing is corneal disease. And at the moment what we're doing is we're growing new skin for the surface of the eye because it turns out that almost all of that haze, that hazy cornea, results from the fact that it's the skin on the surface of the eye, the front layer that Vicky was showing you, it's that skin that lets you down, it's that skin that goes misty and hazy. And so what we do is we grow new skin and transplant it onto patients uh, like this. So Sorry, if, if anybody doesn't like gruesome pictures. This is a normal cornea. It's got a nice transparent skin on the front. This is a cornea in which the skin on the front here has failed. And so the skin that normally covers the, the white of the eye is called conjunctiva. So you know we have conjunctivitis. It's this skin out over the white that gets infected. But when you're missing your skin over your cornea, your corneal skin, the conjunctival skin grows in and it's got blood vessels in it, and it's hazy. And this is what we see happening in aniridia. We see happening in lots of other conditions as well. It's not just aniridia. So what we do, and we can either take cells that are taken from a donor cornea, so someone who's passed away, donated a cornea, and we can take skin cells from that, skin stem cells, and grow them, or we could take from your mouth. So we take a small biopsy from your mouth. These are your own mouth cells. We take them to the lab. Is we put, use enzymes to break them up and to, to dissolve them. So there's the cells dissolved and they're going into a dish in the laboratory. And it's like Vicky was describing. And they grow to form a sheet of cells. And it's the stem cells that have all the ability to, um, to, to give rise to the daughter cells and the sheet grows from the daughter cells, but it contains stem cells as well. We then take this and we expand it again and put it onto something that carries it to the eye. So that, what we just put it on is actually human amniotic membrane. This is placental tissue. We, we put it on some human amniotic membrane and then this allows us to put it on the surface of the eye. So we go to your eye which is damaged and we remove the abnormal skin and we stitch or glue this sheet on to the front and the idea is it's much more transparent and it's much more healthy than the skin you had uh, beforehand. Now if you do this in patients who don't have aniridia, the kind of outcomes you can expect are 8 out of 10 patients can still see very well with clear corneas after 10 years. That's if you don't have aniridia. 
problem is with the analytic patients we've done, only about 4, 40% of patients have an effect that lasts for three years. And by four years, most of our pa patients ended up back to where they were. Now, that's in our first set of patients we did. And I guess there's two things, two reasons why that could be. First of all, these are cells from donor corneas. And you're talking about a foreign set of cells which can be rejected by your immune system. And we think that there's a massive element of the immune system rejecting these cells. So what we're going to do is we're actually going to use your own cells in future, but taken from your mouth. And we're going to repeat a series of treatments and then compare them to what happened when we used the donor cells. And that will take us a bit further down the line of understanding how important this rejection is um, and whether or not these mouth cells are, are, are any good. There's lots of hurdles and challenges in doing this. There, there's even more regulations than that, but they're all the, that's all the th list of things we have to comply with. You need a dedicated lab, a stem cell lab, which don't come cheap. And uh, we're lucky enough to have one of those at the Institute of Ophthalmology um, in London. And uh, we really need to look into this immune rejection and try and figure out if, if it is relevant and how do we prevent it. And lastly, Anna uh, O'Callaghan, she's a, uh, uh, another scientist in the group, and she's been looking at uh, taking the cells from the mouths of anaerobic patients, Stevens Johnson patients, all these diseases that, that, that patients um, develop stem cell deficiency in. And even though your mouth cells still have a Pax6 gene that's abnormal, it doesn't seem to bother them. They seem to grow very well in the dish. And we're hoping that they'll continue to grow well on the surface of the eye. So, so far, so good. We hope to be able to answer this question about are you better off using donor cells from a, an eye or are you better having your own mouth stem cells? And I think that's a really important question for where we're at with treating patients with corneal disease and malaria. In retrospect, this was not the greatest slide to put up with the small writing, but uh, I guess it, it, for me, I, when I'm feeling a bit negative about the research and I've had a bad day and nothing's worked and all the cells have died in the lab and there's an infection spreading through the lab, somebody sneezes in the lab and all the cells get infected and it's just, I mean, I, I kind of, I look at this and what it shows is the progress of the telephone and in prehistoric times, uh, obviously there were no telephones and it goes to the first telephone and then uh, you get the 1980s brick telephone and if you had it told someone at this stage that there'd be such a thing that you could watch TV and have these talks streaming onto your mobile, they'd never have believed you in the 80s. They would never have believed you. And that's where we are today. So I, I don't believe in that things are impossible. And I think we can do uh, what we aim to do. Um, but it just will take time, just like mobile phones do. So lastly, just thank you again to our funders, because this is really expensive, this research. It really does cost an awful lot of money. Um, and we've been very lucky to be well supported uh, by, by these funders. So thanks very much. And thank you to the team, to Julie Daniels, Steve Tuft, and Victoria, and all the rest. So and thank you. Thank you.